very much indeed, Tom. Uh, it's so great to be here in Cornwall. Um, I'm afraid I brought the rain with me from London. I uh, gather you've had some great weather, and um, hopefully we'll get a bit of sun later on today and tomorrow. But I, I know we've got already loads of questions about what's going on in Westminster, what uh, the political system has in store for us in the next few days, the next few weeks. These are absolutely seismic, momentous times. We've never seen anything like it before, and I want to leave a bit of time uh, for questions on that. Uh, I also want to hammer home the message that this is the moment to seize the moment. Uh, we have an amazing opportunity in the Green Party to do so much. We've got this uh, momentous change going on. When I was working in the House of Commons in the early 1990s, my, my hero was Tony Benn. And when Tony Benn retired, he said, I'm leaving the House of Commons to concentrate on politics. <laughs> leaving the House of Commons to concentrate on politics. His conviction that it's movements that really change things. And we've seen a colossal movement just over the last six months, a year, with the school strikes, with Greta Thunberg, uh, with Extinction Rebellion, pushing uh, green issues right up the agenda, pressing home on the climate emergency, the urgency of the climate emergency. Simultaneously, we've seen over 150 councils declare those climate emergencies. My council, Lambeth, being the first in London to do it, we know it was sparked by Bristol in the southwest, and it swept across the country. Uh, we're seeing momentous change from those movements. We are now polling, in some polls have been up to 10%. I've never, we've never been in, up to 10% in a Westminster election poll before. We doubled the number of councillors uh, that we had through our target to win strategy. Don't anyone tell you that it was a fluke. Uh, these 90% of the seats that we won were ones that we were targeting as Guy will tell you and others will tell you our field organisers. It didn't come as a surprise to those that were watching. And then of course, going from three to seven MEPs. Here in Cornwall, just narrowly being, being picked by the Lib Dems, coming third overall in the European elections. And you look round at those Tory seats, those six Tory seats here in Cornwall, and you can see with the Brexit party, they do stand, splintering the Conservative vote. Uh, you've got Greens and Lib Dems waiting there to come through the middle. Uh, and I'm hopeful that it won't be long before we do see a major breakthrough uh, beyond our one MP in Westminster, because boy, do we deserve it. <laughs> boy, is it needed uh, right now. Just on economics, I don't want to stray too far, because this is the subject of the, of the conference. I want to say a few words about that, and then maybe opening up to, to questions. I think the real challenge for us is to make the connection now in people's minds of what's going on with the climate emergency. Uh, between uh, the climate and the environment, not just as a simple package, but the fact that absolutely everything needs to change. And the climate emergency demands that every sector of the economy, every sector of life, the way we live, or the way we work, needs to change. We need to bring that green lens to bear on everything as we talk. And it's up to us to develop that story, to develop that narrative, uh, to be able to develop that language, to explain it. We're the only ones being bold enough and radical enough to say what needs to happen. Uh, but we've got to articulate it. When I was born 40 something years ago, uh, we were sold this vision. We were told that we were going to uh, create unprecedented amounts of wealth. We were told that we we're going to see that stuff of Star Trek, that sci-fi, where we're going to discover the endless supply of energy that would mean we didn't have to rely on oil any longer. We were told that we're going to have major technological breakthrough that would revolutionize the way we work, the way we live, that we work fewer hours, okay? more leisure time, more time to spend with our families. Fast forward 40-something years, and what we've seen is three times the amount of wealth created than when I Three times. The population hasn't increased three times, but the wealth, our riches in this country have increased three times. We've discovered that endless supply uh, of renewable energy. The New Economics Foundation estimates that we could generate over six times our annual electricity needs right now through offshore renewables alone, wind, solar, tidal. We've discovered that endless source of energy. And we've had that technological revolution. We've discovered the microchip, which has changed completely the way uh, we live and work. But are we working shorter hours? No, we're working longer hours than we ever have before. It's come at a colossal environmental price tag. Are we seeing that renewable energy revolution happening? No. Are we seeing the short-term working week? No. And instead of that wealth being shared out equally, what we're seeing is rampant inequality with 1.4 million emergency food bank parcels given out by the Trust and Trust last year. <laughs> we are three times as richer, three times wealthier, far outstripping the population. But now we have this rapid inequality where 1.4 million people are relying on emergency food bank parcels. And the penny is starting to drop for people that it's the same system which is making us, uh, causing this mental health epidemic. 
that this is stressing us out, that's making us work these longer hours, that it's creating this rapid inequality. It's the same system which is destroying and ravaging our environment. It's the same system which is selling us lies. And everything needs to change. That system needs to change. And if we can go out and make this case, if we can go out and be clear about that, then I think this is the moment where we can see some major, major progress with the Green Party and some major, major change, more importantly, in our country. But it means laying new tracks uh, to a new economy. And it's great that we had that uh, quote. Um, we say it slightly differently. Is it a Chinese proverb? A Chinese philosopher speaks. Yeah. Interesting times. So that, that who the economy is for. You know, that fundamental question, we never asked the London School of Economics, and we never asked that question. Who the economy is for? We've forgotten who the economy is for. Uh, and we need to be asking that question, bringing it back to basics, not just simply worshipping at that altar we face the choice. Every other party is pushing hard on the endless illusory growth mantra, worshipping in that altar, saying we just grow a little bit more. If we just create a little bit more wealth, everything's going to be sorted out. You know what? You can't solve uh, the, the economic crisis and the environmental crisis with the same thinking that caused it. We have to have new thinking. Uh, we have to challenge that mantra around growth, and we're the only ones that are doing it. So it means making the right choices over HS2, coming down on the train line here to southwest Cornwall. It took me four four hours. Now we're spending what I would have said six weeks ago was 56 billion on HS2, which we now know is 80 billion on HS2. Shaving off 20 minutes from London to Birmingham. Just imagine what you could do. This is not private sector money. This is completely public money, taxpayers' money, 80 billion pounds. Give you an idea what that is. That is, uh, the NHS budget is running up to about 120, 130,000, uh, 130 billion. Uh, the cost of renewing Trident is somewhere between 105 and 200. Uh, the education budget runs to about 60 billion. HS2 is 80 billion pounds. That gives you an idea of how much money that is. Don't spend it on HS2. Spend it on 500 million pounds for 160 towns and cities around the country, creating that transport revolution, that local transport revolution, which will enable people to get out of their cars and be able to make those journeys to school or the, the school run or to do the shop or to do the commute yeah, with decent public transport, affordable public transport. You know what? They can do it in the rest of Europe. Why on earth can't we do it? Here. It means not renewing tried nuclear weapons. It make, means making the links between uh, investing uh, 36 billion pounds in Hinkley C, a new nuclear power station which is already 10 years overdue, uh, creating uh, dirty power, mining uh, for that uranium, creating environmental destruction. Uh, why are we spending that kind of money on Hinkley when we could be putting six tidal lagoons down the west coast and creating the same kind of energy in half the time? cleaner energy too. Making the links between that nuclear power and renewing tried nuclear weapons. Why are we doing it? Why are we allowing the Chinese to come in and invest in Hinkley C? Because we've got to create uh, the, uh, the resource in order to renew our tried nuclear weapons. That's why we're going down this, this dead end of Hinkley. That's why we're locking ourselves into a deal that will give us more expensive energy bills for 10, 20 years. So let's make the links to nuclear power and nuclear energy. Uh, let's say it very, very clearly, we can't go on with a 30 billion pound growth bill. We've got to make the choices. Let's take that 30 billion and spend it elsewhere. Let's take the 6 billion a year that we would spend on trying to put it into the NHS. There is money there, but it's about making the right choices. We can't expand airports and meet our climate change commitments. Let's introduce a frequent flyer levy instead. Let's tackle the demand. There are alternatives, there are choices, and we are the only party in all these areas. All the other parties are saying something different. All those solutions that I've given you, all the other parties, Lib Dems, Tories, Labour, are all saying let's go in another direction. We are the only party that's saying let's go in this direction. And of course, we have to have a serious conversation about wealth redistribution. To give you an idea of what was on offer in 2017, uh, there was just 48 billion pounds difference between, remember, HS2 is 80 billion pounds, right? There was just 48 billion pounds difference between the Conservative Party spending plans and Labour spending plans at the last general election. Just £48 billion. Pounds. The entire public spend is running at about £800 billion pounds a year. So the Conservatives would have spent 40% of GDP on public spending. Labour would have spent 42% of GDP on public spending. Even Angela Merkel's Christian Democrats over in Europe, the right-wing Christian Democrats, would spend 44%. <laughs> Even they would spend 44% of GDP. Labour are not talking about serious wealth redistribution. Never that the world. They aren't really scratching the surface of what we need to do. Wealth redistribution is the alternative to the endless pursuit of illusory growth. You've got to get the wealth from somewhere. You've got to make the right choices about the wealth that you create. 
and you have to stop worshipping that altar of growth and say, let's take the world that we've got and just simply to put it in the right hands. There is enough money. The problem is that it's in the wrong hands. And it also means that we're going to change the economy tackling the education system. At the moment, let's make those links too. At the moment, we have a system uh, where we're creating economic units to compete in a global marketplace. We don't have a child-centered education. We don't have uh, an education that's equipping our young people to navigate the rapidly changing 21st century economy that they will have to uh, navigate in the years to come. In my children's school, uh, there are, there were, they're getting old now, there were three concentric circles. You walked into the foyer and there were three concentric circles. Uh, and on the outside, if uh, you'd made uh, no progress, your name and your picture would appear. But if you'd made three levels of progress, you'd appear, your name and your picture would appear in the center of the circle. Now my two girls were quite, quite clever, they thrived in that school, they were always uh, at the, in the center of those three concentric circles. But my son, who has learning difficulties, was a wheelchair user, was always on the outside. He walked into that school and every child's name, every child's <coughs> picture was there for everyone to see competing against one another, ranked, uh, using stigma uh, to, you know, is that the way that we want to bring up our children? Absolutely not. We need to completely reimagine our education system and say, who is our education system for? Who is the economy before, but who is our education system for? That child-centered education, which allows our children to truly flourish, to flourish, to understand who they are, that equips them with the tools to navigate uh, what they're going to have to come up against in the 21st century. So it means, you know, we could go into housing, we could go further into transport, we could cover every sector of the economy, but what we do know is that the government is not on track to meet even the two degree target. Uh, it's going to miss its fourth and fifth climate change uh, budgets, carbon budgets, by its own admission, let alone 1.5%, which we know we have to hit uh, under the Paris Agreement. So the, the government is not on track even to hit those targets. We know that it's also fiddling the statistics, not including, for example, aviation emissions uh, in those targets. We are so far behind country. It is absolutely frightening. There was a, uh, a mantra over the last few years from the NGOs, from Greenpeace, from Friends of the Earth and others that said we can't scare people. If we tell people the challenge is too great, people won't know what to do. They'll be caught like rabbits in the headlights. They won't know which way to turn. Well, we've gone past that point. We have no choice. We have to yell it from the rooftops because our very existence depends on it. We risk becoming the first species to document our own extinction. That is have 11 years according to the IPCC report to turn it around and that means not taking action in 11 years time that means we have to complete all the action that we need to take in 11 years and so we have to do it now think about your home most of our people's homes have a boiler we have to get rid of all those boilers we have to strip them all out and we have to be doing it now we have to decarbonize the heat supply think about our agriculture we've got to move away from that intensive uh, animal farming we have to move uh, to more plant-based diet uh, it's more efficient to do it. Think about creating all that feed and all that agricultural land, then fatten up the animals. And the animals are a very inefficient way of running it with huge carbon emissions. We have to transform the agriculture sector. Every single sector of the economy needs to change. And we need to be the ones that are saying that. Friends, the challenges are huge, uh, and the opposition is huge. And what you're seeing at Westminster now is a system that cannot cope uh, with decisions, not just over Brexit. Brexit is a symptom of a system that is on its knees, a symptom a system that can't cope. What we saw in the referendum in 2016 was a howl of rage, and we need to listen to that. Uh, it isn't just good enough to say we, need, we must remain in the EU, which I passionately believe we must, but we also need to say we need to transform. We need to transform and remain. Uh, when uh, we look at the 2016 result, we need to look at why this happened. Lord Ashcroft did a poll uh, in the 48 hours after the 2016 election. Uh, and he asked a staggering uh, number of questions in depth about why people voted to remain, why people voted to leave. And I really encourage you to go pick that poll out. One of the astonishing things is that 50% of people who voted to leave agreed uh, with the suggestion that capitalism is a system that doesn't work. I'll repeat that. 50% of people who voted to leave agreed with the statement that capitalism doesn't work. There was a howl of rage. And why was there that howl of rage? Well, we've had this electoral system, haven't we, in this country? which for years has just concentrated on a few hundred thousand swing voters in marginal seats. When you have a Tory government, they aren't going to bother about the Labour seats that aren't ever going to change hands. When you have a Labour government, they aren't going to bother about the Tory seats. They don't need to spend the money there, they don't need to care about the people. Uh, it's only those few hundred thousand voters in those swing seats that they need to really, really worry about. And that is what concentrates the minds of politicians who want to win elections. 
So for year after year after year, people in those seats around the country were neglected. Their votes didn't matter in elections. And then what happened in 2016, along comes an election for the first time where every single vote counts. And what did they do? Boy, did they make those votes count. That howl of rage was heard clearly because this was the first time they could vote for that rage for the first time. And that, that rage would be heard. And boy, was it heard. If we want to change people's lives, we have to change the system. And that includes changing the electoral system. It isn't just about getting fair representation for our million, two million, maybe three million people who will now vote for the Greens in a Westminster election. It is about changing people's lives. And we, the, the route to getting that transformation that we need is that shift of power. And that's why we're seeing uh, Extinction Rebellion and ourselves calling very, very loudly for citizens' assemblies. Uh, because we, we have to take the power back into our hands. We're seeing a Westminster system that just cannot deliver, a system that cannot cope anymore, a system that does not deliver, uh, an uncodified constitution uh, which can be manipulated by uh, a prime minister who would frankly be more at home in a dictatorship uh, than the mother of all parliaments. Uh, the abuse of power that's going on right now is unforgivable and we should be out on the streets shouting about it but also saying we need to shift power, we need to change the system, we need a written constitution, we need a proportional House of Commons, we need to uh, be elected uh, second chamber House of Lords, we need to devolve power down to local authorities, we need those regional assemblies, we need that shift of power if we're going to bring about change uh, that we need to see. We were just chatting, we were chatting with a few people before uh, we were here and we were just talking about how other countries devolve a lot more power down to their local authorities and can make much more progress on the climate emergency. And it's great that over 150 local authorities have passed these climate emergencies, but they lack the teeth to implement them and to make the change. If we bring that power down to the local authorities, then we will see that massive grassroots change that we need to see with those uh, local authorities taking the necessary action on, on climate change. So that shift of power is fundamental to changing what, uh, what needs to happen. So that's why our general election campaign will be fought on those three big issues. First of all, the climate emergency, saying no to climate chaos. Secondly, saying yes to remaining. But third, saying very, very clearly that we need that shift of power in order to transform the economy with the Green New Deal and many other measures across every sector. So get ready, the general election is coming. Um, and those will be our three messages as we go out. Um, I rattled through really, really quickly, hopefully giving you some food for thought. There will be questions uh, about what's going on in Westminster as well as everything else. I'm very, very